Today we're going to continue our discussion of formal logic, of sentence logic, which is a type of formal logic, and we're going to focus on something called proofs. Another test for validity are proofs. So we learned one way to show that arguments are invalid and that was short truth tables. But what do we do if the argument is valid? Well, you can use a long truth table to show an argument is valid, but I didn't teach you guys that. And so the method that you're gonna to use to show an argument is valid is proofs. So when you get to the exam, you're likely going to see a set of arguments. They could be in English, they could be translated already. And the instructions could be, could very well be, here are a set of arguments. Do whatever you can to show that they're either valid, if you think they're valid, or invalid. And so you look at the arguments and you will form a suspicion if you think that it's valid, then you should use the method that I'm gonna teach to you right now. And if you think that it's invalid, then you should use the short truth table method. Okay, so let's learn about proofs. They're also called derivations or natural deduction. It's called natural deduction because the moves that and strategies and rules that we're going to learn are supposed to mirror the way we actually reason, the way we naturally think. And as I said, the core element of this method are these short rules that are many valid arguments. Okay, so let's talk about some of them. The first one is called modus ponens and the abbreviation is MP. Modus ponens is Latin for the mode that affirms. So let's say we had a statement that was an, a conditional. If A, then B. Let's say we knew that that conditional was true. And we also knew that A is true. Well, if A guarantees B, and I've got A, then what do I got? Well, I've got B. And remember, those three dots stands for therefore. So any argument that has this form, so the rule of modus ponens is really about an argument form. It's a cookie cutter for an infinite number of arguments that have a conditional statement as a premise and then another premise that is the affirmation of the antecedent. Remember in the arrow statement the left side is called the antecedent. The second premise affirms that antecedent and that's why this is called modus ponens, the mode that affirms that affirms what? Namely the antecedent. Okay, that's abstract enough. Let's look at a concrete example. Suppose that if Bob lives in Iraq, then Bob lives in the Middle East. Well, we don't have to suppose because that's true. And then you find out that Bob really does live in Iraq. Well, then what do you know? Bob lives in Iraq, and that guarantees he lives in the Middle East. So you know Bob lives in the Middle East and that's modus ponens. Any statement that you sub in for A and B will be such that the argument will be valid. So that's modus ponens. Here is the symbolization of that English argument. So Bob lives in Iraq, will symbolize with I, and Bob lives in the Middle East will symbolize with M. So if he lives in Iraq, then Bob lives in the Middle East. That's I, arrow, M. Bob lives in Iraq, remember, is I. 
Thus, Bob lives in the Middle East. So you can see the English, and then you can see the sentence logic symbolization of that English, and notice that the symbolization on the bottom matches the form of modus ponens. In this case, instead of A, we have I, and instead of B, we have M, and it matches that form. So if it matches that form, then the argument's going to be valid. So that's modus ponens. Next up, we have a similar named argument called modus tollens. That's the mode that denies. The abbreviation is MT. And we're going to have... We're going to also have a premise that is a conditional statement, A, arrow, B. But the second premise is going to be the negation of B. And what follows from those two premises, keep in mind that the order doesn't matter. You know, so if I, you know, the order of the premises is, a, is, is irrelevant. So if my first premise were not B and my second premise were A, arrow, B, then this conclusion would still follow the negation of A. And that holds for all of these arguments. Um, the, you know, when, when you write it the form, you have to pick an order if you're only going to write one version of it. And that, um, that doesn't matter, the, the order of the premises. The conclusion has to, uh, is distinct from that order. And that's followed by the three dots, the therefore. Okay, let's do uh, an example of this. We'll keep the same premise. You know, Bob living in Iraq means he lives in the Middle East. Okay, we all know that. But then it turns out Bob doesn't live in the Middle East. Right? Maybe Bob is you, or maybe Bob is a friend of yours who lives in California. So you know that Bob doesn't live in the Middle East. So, what do we know? Well, that means that Bob doesn't live in Iraq. Right? So, ho so you, uh, hopefully you can kind of see why this is um, sometimes called natural deduction because that it should make sense you know once you kind of get it it should make sense well that that that's funny what I just said is it that's that's uh, that kind of has to be true once you get it it has to make sense well yeah if you get it it makes sense okay sorry about that all right here's the symbolization same first premise I arrow M I if I then M Remember, I, it doesn't just stand for Iraq. It has to stand for a complete statement. Bob lives in Iraq, and M stands for Bob lives in the Middle East. And we know that M is false because Bob doesn't live in the Middle East, and what follows is that Bob can't, does not live in Iraq. And that's modus tollens. Another basic argument, that, or argument form, rather, that we're going to use for proofs is called disjunctive syllogism, DS. The reason why it has this name is because the first premise is going to be a wedge statement, a disjunction, in this case A or B, and syllogism, if I haven't told you already, is a fancy term for a two-premise deductive argument, and that's what this is going to be. In, uh, in some books, including the text for this class, it's called disjunctive argument same thing. Okay, so if you know that um, either the statement A or statement B is true, and then you find out that A is false, well then what do you know? You know that B has to be true. For example, let's say that you are Sherlock Holmes, and you are on the look, you are on the, um, you're, you're trying to find a murderer, and you narrow down the murderer's location to one of two cabins, cabin A and cabin B. And you know, let's say for sure, you know for sure that the murderer is in cabin A or cabin B. That, that's just a fact now. And you go and you investigate. And first you start by checking out cabin A. And guess what? The murderer is not there. They're not in cabin A. So then what do you know? You've ruled out cabin A. You know it's either A or B. Well, now you know where the murderer is. The murderer, it's kind of a hard word to say, isn't it? Murderer is in cabin B. And that's disjunctive 
syllogism. Psychologists have done some studies to confirm that some non-human animals have a capacity for reason, and they think that dogs, for instance, can do, in some sense, they can do disjunctive syllogism. And they figured this out by having a, a drug-sniffing dog be on the scent of um, you know, some illicit drug like cocaine or marijuana or something, and the dog is sniffing around, sniffing around, and then it gets to a fork in the road, and um, you know, it, it does. It's not sure. It knows that there's only two paths, so that it, it knows the dog knows that the um, the cocaine is either down the A path or the B path, and so the dog eventually just picks one. Let's say it goes down the um, the A path, kind of sniffs around there at the end, and then. Um, and then what it does is it goes back to the fork, and it doesn't stop, and it immediately goes down the B path. So they think that dogs, the dog knew that when it got to the fork, okay, it's either A or B, and then it ruled out A by sniffing around, and then it immediately knew that it must, the cocaine must be on the B trail. It's pretty cool. So here's the symbolization for this uh, English. Um, a or B. Now notice that this A or B uh, looks a lot like the the top A or B, but it's different. These are capital letters. So capital letters have to stand for specific English sentences. The lowercase letters, they don't stand for English. They stand for sentences that are grammatically correct in our artificial language, which is sentence logic. So in this case, little a corresponds to capital A. And capital A stands for the murderer is in cabin A. And capital B stands for the murderer is in cabin B. But we know that A is false. We know not A because the murderer isn't in cabin A. So, of course, the murderer has to be in cabin B. Now, you might be thinking, well, what if we rule out, what if we have A or B and we rule out B? Then doesn't that mean we know that A is the case? And that's absolutely right. So this is the other version of disjunctive syllogism. So disjunctive syllogism is different than modus ponens and modus tollens in that there are two versions of it. And so in this world, we first we know the murderers in cabin A or B, but we rule out cabin B. And so we know the murderer is in cabin A. So again, we have A or B. We rule out B this time. And so we know A must follow, and that's disjunctive syllogism. Yeah, syllogism, it's hard to say. Okay, here is the fourth argument form in no particular order. It's called hypothetical syllogism, HS, and in uh, the textbook it's called the chain argument, which I think better captures what's going to go on here. But in hypothetical syllogism, you're going to have two conditional statements. And that's why you get the hypothetical, because in a conditional statement, you've got a condition which follows an if, right? If A, then B. And um, the, the, if, the part that follows the if is a hypothetical, right? If you clean your room, hypothetically, if you clean your room, then you can go out and play. And again, syllogism because it's a two-premise deductive argument. Well, if A leads to B and B leads to C, then A has to lead to C, right? If A is true, I mean, sorry, no, we don't, we don't know A is true, do we? Because we would need uh, just a plain A. But if A's being true leads to B and B's being true leads to C, then A leads to C. Let's look at an English example. Let's say you know that if Juliet travels to South America this summer, then she will need malaria pills, right? That's something that might be the case. And you also know that if, she's, if she needs those malaria pills, then she's going to have to go see a pharmacist. Well, if traveling to South America means malaria pills and malaria pills means see the pharmacist, then we know that if Juliet travels to South America, she will have to see the pharmacist. In other words, S arrow M. 
And S stands for Juliet travels to South America. M stands for she needs malaria pills. S arrow M. M arrow P. P stands for Juliet will have to see the pharmacist. Then we know S arrow P. Right? I kind of think of it as S indirectly leads to P. S leads to M, M leads to P, so S leads to P. Sometimes I think about it like this. Uh, if you hop on the S train, you're going to end up in M town. And then from M town, you hop on the M train, which will take you to P city. So if you hop on that S train, you know you're going to end up in P city. So S leads to P. Or guarantees or entails. Lots of ways to say it. So that's hypothetical syllogism. Okay, here is another rule named after a philosopher whose last name is De Morgan. De Morgan's theorem. And that's abbreviated uh, D E capital M. We talked about this a little bit when we did translations. If you have a negated wedge statement, like the negation of A or B, A wedge B, another way to write that is not A and not B. So these two are logically equivalent to each other. So De Morgan realized that whenever you have a negated wedge statement, that's equivalent to an AND statement with both parts negated. And similarly, if you have a negated AND statement, like not A and B in parentheses, that's equivalent to not A or not B. So let's go through an example to explain this. Let's say you knew that it's neither Saturday nor Sunday. You know, maybe you are at work and you forget what day it is. You know, sometimes we do that, but you're at work and you only work uh, 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. So you know that it's neither Saturday nor Sunday. Well, another way to say that is that it's not Saturday and it's not Sunday. So if we symbolize this, it's neither Saturday nor Sunday, we could symbolize as the negation of a wedge statement. It's false that it's either Saturday or Sunday. And that another way to write that, as we know from translations, is not S and not U. So those are equivalent. Um, we also know that it's false that it's Saturday and Sunday, right? We could have S and U in parentheses and have a negation in front of those parentheses, right? It can never be both Saturday and Sunday. Well, that means that for any day of the week, we know that it's either not Sunday or we know it's not Saturday. And that's the other version of De Morgan's theorem. All right, next up we have simplification, which is abbreviated. These abbreviations will come in, uh, will be important later, so um, make sure to mind them. Simp is the abbreviation. Let's say that you knew that uh, your friends Jose and Juliet are coming to the party. Well, if you know that they're both coming to the party, then um, you know Juliet is coming, right? I mean, this is a really simple inference and maybe that's why it has this name. Uh, and we could abbreviate the first one as J and U. Right? And J, does J stand for Jose? No. What does it stand for? Jose is coming to the party. And U, which is short for Juliet, is coming to the party. Why didn't I pick J again? Well, because we already specified J goes with Jose, so we needed another letter, and so what I often do is go to the next letter in the important word, which is the U of Juliet. So if you got J and U, then what follows necessarily is uh, U. Right? If both of those are true, then, then one of them, if they're both true, then they're true individually. What else do you know? Well, if, if you know they're both coming to the party, you know Jay, right? You know Jose is going to come to the party. You know, uh, so those statements, it's, it's just almost too easy, too obvious, rather, an inference. So in this case, it would be J and U, and what follows is just J. Okay, so hopefully that was an easier rule. And then finally, the last rule I'm going to teach you about, there, there are lots of these. You know, in, in a lot of books, there are 20 rules but uh, we're just going to learn uh, this set, is double negation. And I could have taught you this first because it's so obvious, 
But if you have a two negations in front of a statement, say not not a, another way to say that is just to drop the negations. They cancel each other out. That's equivalent to a. For example, if we know that it's not the case that James didn't go to Canada, um, we know that he did go to Canada, right? If it's false that he didn't go, then he did go. And we could abbreviate that as not not C, and of course that would be equivalent to C, C standing for James did go to Canada. Okay, so now we're going to use these rules to prove that more complicated arguments are valid. So let's start with this English argument. Premise one, Mary is a puppy. Premise two, if Mary is a puppy, then she isn't a cat. Premise three, if Mary wears a flea collar, then she is a cat. Thus, Mary does not wear a flea collar. So when we go through this, you can probably tell that it's valid, maybe not. And if you can't, then that's, gr that's great in a sense because that's the whole, one, well, maybe not the whole point, that's one of the points of doing all this is if you ever have an argument and you don't know if the inference is valid, we have a system now to show that, what I'm about to teach you. So first we have to symbolize this, and that's why we spent a whole section learning how to take English and put it into our formal language of sentence logic. So Mary is a puppy, let's say is P, if Mary is a puppy, then she is not a cat, would be P arrow not C. If Mary wears a flea collar, then she's a cat, would be F arrow C. And now we're going to, in this um, in this system of proofs, instead of putting the conclusion after the premises, we're going to put it on the last line after the last premise. So that forward slash separates the final premise from the conclusion. The three dots stands for therefore... Um, not F, which is Mary doesn't wear a flea collar. So that was kind of fast. Let's go through that again. P stands for Mary's a puppy. Two, if Mary's a puppy, then the arrow, she isn't a cat, not negation C. Premise three, if she wears a flea collar, then she is a cat, F arrow C. And then conclusion, uh, she doesn't wear a flea collar, not F. All right, focus on lines one and two. We've got P. And P leads us to, or logically guarantees, not C. So don't we have not C? Yes. And anything that validly follows from our rules, we can write on a subsequent line. So in line four, so lines one, two, and three, we know are true because they're the premises. But on line four, we know that not C is the case. Why? Well, that's why after not C, I wrote 1, 2, because I'm saying look at lines 1 and 2, and because of the rule of MP, modus ponens, right? Again, look at 1, P. P implies, that's what the arrow means, not C. So I've got not C, and I'm going to write that on a new line, which is line 4, not C. How do I know that? Because of lines 1 and 2 and the rule of modus ponens. And I'm going to keep asking myself, what do I know and using these rules until I arrive at the conclusion? And that's actually going to follow from 3 and 4. Look at 3 and 4. You know that F implies C. F guarantees C. But C is false. That's what line 4 says. So F has to be false. Another way to read um, F arrow C is that C is a requirement for F. Right? If F guarantees C, then C is required for F to be true. But look, we don't have C because of line 4. And if C is required for F, that means we don't have F. This was the modus tollens rule. Remember with modus tollens, whenever you have a, an arrow statement, which we do on line 3, and you have the negation of the right side, which we have on line 4, what follows is the negation of the left side. And think about the English of um, 3 and then the English of what 4 would be. 3 would say, if Mary wears a flea collar, I almost said colander. If Mary wears a flea collar, then she's a cat. But we know Mary's not a cat. So then she can't wear a flea collar. If it's true that if she wears a flea collar, then she's a cat. Now we know it's true in real life that 3 is uh, false, right? I could put a flea collar 
on a person, and that doesn't mean that they're a cat. But in this argument, we're assuming that three is true. So you have sometimes you have to do that. You have to kind of pretend. And look, on line five, we've arrived at the conclusion. And so we've completed this proof. And what we have shown is that not F follows from the premises. Because the, we've shown that it, you can use um, these two valid rules, modus ponens and modus, to, modus tollens, to sort of connect the premises to the conclusion. So the conclusion has to follow from the premises because of modus ponens and modus tollens. Those two arguments are valid. And so the, the argument as a whole has to be valid. Okay, let's practice a little bit more and I think things will become more clear. Take this English argument. Tim is neither going to Miami nor Honolulu. He's not going to either. If Tim doesn't go to Miami, he won't learn to salsa dance, let's say. And let's say that he's got to learn to salsa or ballroom dance. Let's say he's having trouble with the ladies and someone told him, just learn how to dance, especially salsa or, or ballroom. So he's like, okay, I'm going to learn one of them for sure. Uh, we also know he's not going to Miami or Honolulu, and we know that if he doesn't go to Miami, he's not going to learn to salsa dance. So what follows from these three statements? Well, we know that Tim has got to learn to ballroom dance. Since he's got to learn the salsa or ballroom dance, and we know that he's not going to salsa dance because he's not going to Miami. And if he doesn't go to Miami, he won't learn the salsa dance. But he's going to salsa, he's got to learn the salsa or ballroom. And so the only one that's left is ballroom. So that's sort of the, the reasoning. So let's prove, I sort of walked through it in English. Let's use our system to formally prove that this argument is valid. Well, first we symbolize it. So we should be getting better at this. Premise one would become the negation, or could, these are, you know, we could use different letters, but if we use M and H, then premise one becomes the negation of M wedge H. So it's false that Tim is going to Miami, that's capital M, and H stands for Tim is going to Honolulu. The second premise, not M arrow not S. If Tim doesn't go to Miami, then he won't learn to salsa dance. So M stands for Tim does go to Miami, as we said, and let's have S stand for he will learn how to salsa dance. So we have not M because he didn't go to Miami and not S because he won't learn to salsa dance. Line three would be S or B. He's got to learn to salsa dance or, that's the wedge, ballroom dance. And then we've got the conclusion on that line, therefore, B, he's got to learn to ballroom dance. So this argument's valid. Let's prove it. Well, we know through De Morgan's theorem that line 1 is equivalent to not M and not H. Why? Well, because of line 1, De Morgan's. So, whenever, so, you, so when you do these proofs, you write out the premises, and then you put the conclusion following the last premise line, and then you ask yourself what you know, and on subsequent lines, you write what you know, what, what necessarily follows through the rules, and you, then after you write what follows, like we did on line four, we know that not M and not H follows, then you have to say why. Well, you have to, um, you'll have to, you have to tell me what lines you used, in this case line one, and then the abbreviation of the rule. The rule is De Morgan's, the abbreviation of which is DEM, D-E capital M. Right? Uh, look at that connection from 1 to 4. We know that 4 is another way to write 1. So that's a legal move. That's a valid move to go from 1 to 4. Well, now that we, so in general, this is a, now we can start talking about strategies. In general, if you have a negated wedge statement, and that's what we have on line one, we have a negated wedge statement, then start thinking De Morgan's. You know, I almost want the De Morgan's is dead, but I, it, but it would be awesome if the ghost of De Morgan's is whispering in your ear when you see a negated wedge statement. Think I gotta do De Morgan's. I gotta do De Morgan's, and you're gonna turn that negated wedge statement into an and statement. And what's great about that is once we have 
a statement uh, whose main connective is the and, we can do simplification, right? Since not M and not H are true, we know that not M is true individually. Why? Because of line 4, simp, right? Think back to truth conditions. If we put a T underneath that ampersand, then what would we know about not M? It would have to be true, right? Because both parts of a true and statement have to be true. And so anything that's true, I can put on a line. And on line 5, I put that true statement of not M. And that was for simplification. Are we done yet? No, we need to get to B. Our conclusion is B. Well, now focus on lines 2 and 5. I've got not M now, don't I, on line 5. Not M will lead me to not S, so I've got not S. That's modus ponens, right? I know not S is true because of 2 and 5, line 2 and line 5, and the rule of modus ponens, right? I, I'm, with modus ponens, I need an arrow statement. I've got an arrow statement on line 2. Do I have the left side anywhere? Yes, on line 5, I've got the left side of that arrow statement. And so then on the next line, I can write the consequent, the right side, which is not S. So let's do the English version. On line 5, I know that Tim didn't go to Miami. Well, I also know from premise 2 that if he didn't go to Miami, he's not going to learn to salsa dance. So I know he's not going to learn to salsa dance, and that's what I put on line 6. And then finally, look at lines 3 and 6. He, he promised himself he's going to learn to salsa or ballroom dance. And salsa dancing's out because he didn't go to Miami, right? We know that from line six. So if he promised, he's going to, for sure, he's going to do salsa or ballroom, and he didn't do salsa, well, then we know that through disjunctive syllogism that he's going to learn to ballroom dance. He must learn. And that's three and six, disjunctive syllogism or disjunctive argument. Okay? So... Think about what we're doing. We're looking at this argument, and it's in English, and we can kind of see that it's valid. We can see that the conclusion follows, but sometimes when the argument gets really complicated, we can't tell. And so philosopher said, well, let's come up with a step-by-step -step way, um, a, um, a formal way that we could use for any English argument that we can translate into our language to show that it's valid, and that's exactly what we did, right? It's sort of a mapping of the reasoning that we already do, and that's why it's called natural deduction. All right, how about this one? If Jackson went to Mexico and Belize, he needed a passport. Okay, fair enough. And if he needed a passport, then he had to go to the the drugstore, he had to go to CVS to get a passport photo. But what if it turns out that Jackson didn't need to go to CVS to get a passport photo? Okay. And let's also suppose that Jackson indeed went to Mexico. So what would follow from those four premises? This one's a little bit more complicated, isn't it? It might not be clear what follows, but what follows from these four premises is that Jackson did not go to Belize. So this is a better example because you might not see why the argument is valid. And that's what's great about this method is because it will show you in a step-by-step -step way that will confirm that this is valid. So first, let's symbolize. Premise one, Jackson went to Mexico and Belize. If he did, then he needed a passport. Well, that's going to be M and B, and we're going to put those in parentheses, arrow P. Right? M and B, arrow P. He went to Mexico and Belize, then he needed a passport. We also know that if he needed a passport, he needed to go to the drugstore, namely CVS. So that would be P for he needed a passport, then C, which is he went to CVS. We know that he didn't go to CVS, so not C. We also know he went to Mexico, and the conclusion is he did not go to Belize, not B. All right, look at lines 1 and 2. Don't we have a chain argument? We have a hypothetical syllogism. M and B lead to P. P 
P leads to C. So on line 5, I know M and B lead to C. Or in other words, if M and B, then C. So that's lines 1 and 2, hypothetical syllogism, right? M and B lead to or entail P. P entails C. So I can sort of condense those two premises into M and B arrow C. But now look at line 3 and 5. Look at line 3 and 5. I know C is false. And on 5, I've got this arrow statement, M and B arrow C. Well, whenever you have, in general, whenever you have an, a statement, the main connective is the arrow. And in line 5, the main connective is the arrow. Right? Again, to know what a main connective is, you have to know what main means and what connective means. Well, our connectives are the five symbols. The negation, the arrow, the ampersand, the wedge, and the double arrow. And the main connective in five is the connective that applies to the whole statement. There are two connectives, the ampersand and the arrow. The main connective can't be the and, the ampersand, because it only, it only applies within the parentheses. The main connective has to be the arrow because that's the connective that applies to the whole statement. So how does modus tollens work? Well, I've got an arrow statement on line 5. And um, if, I, in if I have an arrow statement and in addition to that I have the negation of the right side, which I have in line 3, then what follows is the negation of the left side. Not M and B in parentheses. How do I know that? Because of 3 and 5 and the rule of modus tollens. Here's one more simple example of modus tollens. Let's say that I told you that I, um, let's say that I told you that I uh, got a dog as a pet. We know that, um, we know that if it's a dog, then it has to be a mammal, right? If it's a dog, then it, uh, it's a mammal. So I told you I got a dog as a pet, but let's say that someone else gets a pet. And you're like, well, what is it? Well, you, well, they say, well, it's not a mammal. It's not a mammal. Well, since we also know that if it's a dog, that it's a mammal, then we know that it can't be a dog, right? If someone says, I got a pet and it's not a mammal, you know it's not a dog. So that's modus tollens. So in this case, if someone told you that... Um, if someone told you that they didn't go to CVS, then you know, we know that Jackson didn't go um, to both Mexico and Belize. Okay. Well, now look at line six. Now the ghost of De Morgan should be whispering in your ear. Whenever you have a negated wedge statement or a negated and statement, you should think of De Morgan's. And what you're going to, the way to think about De Morgan's is sort of a distribution of the negation, right? You got not M and B. And that negation is going to distribute through, in a sense, to not M and then put the negation in front of the B. But then you have to, have to, have to remember to change that and to a wedge. Or it won't be right. right? If you know that it can't be both, the, the other English example was, I know it can't be both Saturday and Sunday the same day. So for any day of the week, it's either false that it's Saturday or it's false it's Sunday. Or, right, there's an or in there. How do I know that it's either not M or not B? Well, because of line 6 of uh, De Morgan's, right? Line 6 is equivalent to line 7 because of De Morgan's. Okay, now let's focus on line 4 and 7. This is really close to a disjunctive syllogism. Right? The Sherlock Holmes example, well, instead of cabin A and cabin B, let's say cabin M and cabin B. I know the killer is in, or, or so no, we have to change, sorry. We, let's, instead of A and B, let's have cabin, call it not M and cabin not B. Right? Let's, it just has weird names. So the killer is in cabin not M or cal, cabin not B. Well, look at line four. We know that the killer is in cabin M. 
So we know that they are not in cabin B, right? But for disjunctive syllogism to work, you need to have a wedge, a wedge statement, which we do on line 7. And you also need to have the negation of one of the two parts, right? You have to have a wedge statement, which we have, but you need the negation of one of the two parts. Well, the first part is not M. The second part, we're looking at line 7. The first part is not M. The second part, the right part is not B. To have the negation of either of those, we would need not not M. Or we would need not not B. So nowhere in the argument do we have either of those. But we have something equivalent to one of them. We have M on line 4. And we know through uh, double negation, DN, that, that, that M is equivalent to not not M. Right? You see, the reason why we had to double negate it is because, for again, for DS to work, you have to have the negation, the literal negation of one of the parts. And we have something equivalent to the negation, but we don't technically have the negation of not M. So we have to double negate it first, technically. And that's what we do. We, on line 8, we know that not M, not, sorry, rather, we know not not M is true because of line 4 and a double negation. And now we can do DS to get our conclusion. Right? On line 7, I know it's either not M or not B. I've ruled out the left part because of line 8, and so the, the, the right part must be the case. And that's not B through 7, 8, disjunctive syllogism, DS. And that is our conclusion of Jackson didn't go to Belize. So this argument was pretty complicated, and that's why I saved it for last. So, um, so again, what you're most likely going to have to do for the, the exam is I'm going to give you uh, arguments in English, and some of them will be valid, some will be invalid. You will have to um, symbolize all of them, so that will practice the translation part of this section. And then what, what I would recommend doing is um, look at the English, look at the symbolization, take your best guess. Do you think it's valid? Do you think it's invalid? If you think that it's valid, then you'll do a proof to prove that it's valid. If you, if you suspect that it's invalid, then you'll do a short truth table. And um, what you can do kind of off to the side is, if you're not sure, just try one of them. And um, if it's not working out, then try the other method. Because only one of them is going to work, right? You can, here's, some, here's something new I haven't told you. You cannot use a proof to prove an argument is invalid. It just won't work. And you cannot use a short truth table to prove an argument is valid. So um, use your suspicion, and if it's not working out, try the other method. One of them will work out. So if you just, so a fail-safe would be just, do, just attempt both methods, and if you do them properly, one will work out, and you'll have your answer. Okay, and then what, finally what I've left you with here are um, two pages of practice problems. So this part of the course, instead of kind of learning facts and learning how to utilize those facts, it's much more like, um, you know, like a, a f um, like an art class, or it's like a um, a music class, a performance class, where like you're, I'm teaching you how to do something. So you can't just watch someone paint or sculpt or play piano, and then you just pick it up. You kind of have to do it for yourself. So I really strongly encourage you to um, practice these um, these problems here. Okay, so I'll run through some of them right now because you might want to know, well, I practice, but I want to make sure I'm doing them right. So with number one, uh, you're, so you're going to use these, these four core rules to do these 14 problems. You, you, you know, you're not going to have to turn these in, but um, if you want to do well on the exam, I would practice with them. To do number one, you're going to have to use modus tollens. It's going to be one step. For number two, you're going to have to use modus ponens. So, so I would, you know, if you're going to run through these, maybe pause, and then I'm, I'm kind of give, going through the answers here. Number three, you're going to use disjunctive syllogism. For number four, you are going to use hypothetical 
syllogism or chain argument. For number five, you're going to use hypothetical syllogism and then you're going to use modus tollens. So that one's a, it will take two rows. For six, you're going to need disjunctive syllogism with one and three, and then you're going to need modus ponens with line two and four. For seven, you're going to have to do modus tollens with two and three. That'll lead you to not D. And then on line four, I mean, yeah, with, then with line four and line one, you'll do a modus ponens to get E. For eight, you have to do a disjunctive syllogism with two and three to get not H, and then another disjunctive syllogism with line four and one to get G. For number nine, you have to do a modus ponens with one and four to get A or B, and then once you have that, you'll set up a disjunctive syllogism with lines two and five to get A, and then you'll use that A to get the conclusion of D. So you'll use line three and whatever line you're on and modus ponens to get D. For number 10, you have to do DS with two and four to get not D. Then once you have not D, you'll set up a modus ponens with line four and three to get A horseshoe B. That's a pretty complicated one. This is getting more complicated than what you'll see on the exam, but it's good practice. And then once you have A horseshoe B on, I think you're on line five, or sorry, on line six now, then you'll use that in combination with line one to get the conclusion of C. So one and line six, I believe it'll be line six, and modus ponens will get you the conclusion. For 11, you'll have to do a DS with two and four, and then you'll have to do a, that'll get you not D, and then you'll do a modus ponens with that not D and line three, which will get you A, and then with that A in combination with line one, you'll do a modus ponens to get B horseshoe C, and then, then once you have that, you'll have to use line two and a modus tollens, that's a really tough problem, to get not B. So now these are getting much more complicated than um, you'll have to, than what you'll need to do. But again, it's great practice. For 12, you'll do, oh, here we go. Um, a, I don't think you have to do a De Morgan. You could do a De Morgan's on one, but look at four. You got main connective is a wedge statement, and you have the negation of the left side on line one. So the first step I would do is DS with one and four. That will get you... Um, not T, and that sets up a modus ponens with three. You got not T, and then on three you got if not T, then not L or M. So you're going to get not L or M, and that's the negation of the left side of line two, and that'll get you the conclusion of R. With 13, two and four you can do a DS, and you'll end up with B horseshoe C. Oh, by the way, you've seen all these horseshoes. Golly, sorry about this. So remember, the horseshoe is a um, another way of doing the and. I should have said that a long time ago. I apologize. So the, all those horseshoes, and that's that kind of um, capital U that's turned on its side, those are, um, those are uh, the same as the arrow. So, oh man, I apologize for that. Okay, so back to 13. You got not A. Um, and through disjunctive syllogism, you'll get B arrow C, or B horseshoe, it's called C. And once you get that, look at line three. That's the left side of three, and so you'll set up a modus ponens to get A or B. And once you have that, look at line one. You've got the left side of one, which will give you the conclusion of B or C, another modus ponens. For 14 here, you have a T or R on line four, and that's the left side of two, which through modus ponens will get you the right side, which is P and Q. So once you have P and Q, you've got the left side of line one, which will get you all of the right side, which is R or T and S. You know T and S is false because of line three. So through a disjunctive syllogism with line three and whatever line 
R or T and S is on, you'll get the conclusion through disjunctive syllogism of R. So those last few ones are definitely super complicated, but good practice nonetheless. And uh, finally, the, this batch uh, practices simplification and De Morgan's a bit, so I wanted to show you that. Um, so uh, for number three, we would we need we're going to do a DS, but we have to double negate line two first. And remember, um, line two is just T. The conclusion isn't really part of line two, even though it's there. That, that's a bit confusing, but I think I taught you that. So if you double negate T on line two. Then you'll have the negation of the left side of line one, and you'll end up with the conclusion of S. For um, number four here, there now the ghost of De Morgan should be whispering in your ear. We have the negation of a wedge statement. And when we have that, we should do De Morgan's, and we'll end up with not J and not K. And then we do simplification to get not K. On line five, again, the ghost of De Morgan's. We have a negated and statement. So that dot is another way. I think I taught you that. The dot is another way of doing the ampersand for and, negated and statement. And what we end up with is not F and not G. Sorry. Oh, I screwed up. I got to be careful. It's been a long lecture. Um, we won't let, it won't be and. We, I told you, you have to have to change it to the wedge. So we'll end up with not F or not G, right? And if we double negate line two, that F, then we'll have the negation of the left side of that wedge statement. We've got um, not F or not G, and then if we double negate F, we'll have not not F, which is the negation of not F, right? I know that's a lot of negations, but it's true. And then we do DS to get the conclusion of not G. All right, six got cut off, that's fine, so skip that one. Uh, go to nine. Um, this is a good one. One and two. Let's focus on those. One is an arrow statement. Pretend that horseshoe is an arrow. We have the negation of the right part, right? So think modus tollens. Modus tollens. And what will end up is the negation of the left part, which is a negated and statement. And we should hear the ghost of De Morgan's negated and statement. And when we do De Morgan's, we'll end up with not P or not Q. And then if we double negate three, we've got the negation of um, not Q, and we'll end up with not P. And then finally, 10, um, two, we have a De Morgan's, right? Negated or statement. So when we, when we distribute those negations through and change the wedge to the dot, we'll get not not A and not B. And we can do simplification and uh, we want the not B, we'll simplify that, and that'll set up a modus ponens with line one. So if we have not B, and not B uh, takes me to not C, then I've got not C, and that's the negation of the left side of three, and finally, through disjunctive syllogism, we'll end up with our conclusion D. So um, practice with those. And uh, good luck. And you can always eat. I know this is kind of tough, especially just kind of watching the videos. But, um, but I believe in you. You can email me. Come see me in my office hours. And good luck. That is, uh, that's it for sentence logic. We'll go back to non-mathy things next time. So congratulations on getting through all of that.